Hola amigos, que tal? Stuart here from Spain Speaks with a different type of video today. I'm going to talk about this new proposed startup law that the government is working on and also about a new digital nomad visa that the government also has in its plans. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. Now in Spain currently there's a huge push to revitalize the economy. The economy has been stagnant for some times, of course going back to the 2008 to 2012 financial crisis and now of course with the coronavirus pandemic the economy is not looking good. Fortunately for Spain, lots of money is coming into the country and the government has announced on many occasions that it wants to change the economy completely, move towards a more greener economy, a more digitalized economy, and that is why they want to attract foreign talent to the country. And one of the ways they want to attract foreign workers is by making it easier to set up a company and also making it easier for people to work remotely. And as we know, both of those things have not been easy up until now. Historically, I would say, and I'm sure a lot of other people would agree with me that Spain has not been a business friendly country especially when it comes to small business and also the self-employed. The financial costs of setting up a small company have been prohibitive. For example you need 3,000 euros in capital to start a small business. A lot of people can't get their hands on that cash and also when it comes to being self-employed the social security payments that you have to make each month can be a killer for a lot of people. But as I said, the government wants to change all this. And one of the things they're proposing to do is bring down the amount of capital necessary to start a company to one euro instead of the 3,000. And also when it comes to the self-employed or autonomos as they are called in Spanish, there are also reductions on social security payments when you first start. So what are some of the key aspects of this proposed startup law going to be? Well, obviously the government is going to put on the table tax incentives. There's going to be more favorable regulations for startup companies, and they're also going to eliminate a lot of the bureaucratic obstacles. And as we all know, bureaucracy is one of the biggest obstacles in Spain when it comes to doing business. So what are some of the tax incentives going to be? Well, they're talking about a flat tax of 15% for those startup companies for the first four years. So that's a positive. And there's also going to be some changes apparently when it comes to the way non-residents pay taxes in Spain. So what does the government hope to achieve with these changes? Well, they want to attract international talent, of course. They want to boost investment in research and development and innovation. They want to position the country as a reference for entrepreneurship in the European Union. And they want to facilitate the path for foreign people to be able to obtain residency. Again, something that has been very difficult to get in Spain, residency, especially if you don't come from a European Union country. I could spend the next two hours talking about how difficult it was for me to obtain residency residency in this country when I first came here 21 years ago. It was a very difficult process and there were a lot of bureaucratic hurdles to jump. Now I said before that Spain hasn't traditionally been an attractive place for people to start a company up. And if we have a look at this graph, we can see that Spain is a long way behind other countries in Europe when it comes to attracting startup talent. We can see the most popular countries in Europe for startups, Estonia, Ireland, Denmark, Finland, the Netherlands, Sweden, Switzerland, the UK, and we have to go a fair way down to find Spain. In fact, Spain only has 157 startups for every million inhabitants. So the objective of the government is to move Spain up that list. Are they going to be successful? Well, critics of the plan say that it falls short in a lot of aspects. They also say that there is a lack of government ambition and that the Spanish government doesn't really understand the startup culture. They say that what the government defines as a startup is too narrow. And they say that there should be more advantages like not having to pay social security for the first year. So that's a little bit of a summary about Spain's proposed startup law. Now let's talk about the digital nomad visa. Now I'll just interrupt the video here to give a shout out and thank Thanks to the sponsor of today's video, Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning community for creatives where millions come together to take the next step in their creative journey. Skillshare offers thousands of inspiring classes on a wide range of topics that include productivity, health and wellness, personal development, painting, gardening, and lots more. Now, if you are thinking of becoming a digital nomad and considering a move to Spain or any other country, you can find classes on Skillshare that will help you make the transition. For example, these classes by Douglas Butler on how to become a digital nomad in 2021 could give you some ideas on how you could start working remotely. And if you come to live in a country like Spain, it's also a good idea to know a little bit of the local language before you get here. And on Skillshare, you'll find hundreds of classes to help you brush up on your language skills. For me, the main advantage of Skillshare is that it has classes to suit any skill level. You can be a beginner, a pro, a dabbler or a master, it does not matter. You will find classes to suit you on Skillshare. 
Another pro is that most Skillshare classes are under 60 minutes with short lessons to fit any schedule. And the first 1,000 people to use the link in the description will get a one month free trial of Skillshare. So click the link below and take advantage of the offer and check out Skillshare for yourself. Now back to the video. So with this new visa, the government wants to attract young talent to the country, people that are able to work remotely, digital nomads as they are known. I'm not going to explain what a digital nomad is because I don't really know the exact definition, but I imagine they are people that are able to move around the world with their laptop computers and work remotely. And let's be honest, there are currently a lot of these digital nomads in Spain, but the problem is that a lot of the times they don't pay tax in the country. And that I imagine is one of the main things the government wants to change by offering this new type of visa. As I said before, if you are not a member of a European Union state, it is very difficult to work in Spain. Lots of people from the United States, Canada, Australia, New Zealand come to countries like Spain, want to work, but it's very difficult to get that visa. The way that people have tried in the past was to get a visa called a non-lucrative visa, but this visa does not adapt to the needs of digital nomads apparently. So exactly what is this digital nomad visa going to be? Well, apparently people will be able to live and work in Spain for periods of up to one year. The visa will also be renewable, provided that the worker maintains the same conditions as they did when they first started. And the government is looking to attract foreigners who work remotely from Spain for a foreign company, digital nomads of course, and professionals who work for a foreign company in Spain, including the audiovisual sector. And that sector is one that the government is very keen to attract foreign investment from. In fact, the Prime Minister of the country, Pedro Sánchez, recently said that he wants to turn Spain into the Hollywood of Europe. Now, when it comes to remote working in Spain, one of the questions that a lot of people are no doubt asking themselves is where do you go? Do you go to a big city like Madrid, Barcelona, Valencia? Do you go to a small city? Do you go to a town? Do you go to a pueblo? Do you go to the islands? Do you go to the Canary Islands because the weather's very good down there? Balearic Islands, for example, or do you go to the green north of the country? That is the question. To be honest, I don't think the big cities in Spain are going to have a problem to attract talent, but what about some of the smaller towns and villages around the country? Well, in order to attract this digital nomad talent, a number of small towns and villages have set up a platform, and it is called the Red Nacional de Pueblos Acogedores para el Teletrabajo, and the translation of that would be a national network of towns for remote workers. And as we can see here on this interactive map, there are various towns and villages scattered all over the country. So, why do these towns and villages in Spain want to attract remote workers? Well, the main reason is that they want to revitalize the population. A lot of these places have elderly populations because young people have gone to live in the big cities around the place because they can't work in these places. Not a lot of jobs, unfortunately, and a lot of small towns and villages around the country are slowly dying. So what would be some of the pros and cons of working remotely in some of these small villages here in Spain? Well, one of the pros, obviously, would be that it is cheaper to live in one of these places than in a big city. A lot of these towns and villages offer a true space adventure. They're very authentic places and quite often it's like going back in time. They're also very close to nature and offer fantastic opportunities if you like outdoor activities, for example hiking or riding. But these places also have their cons. For example, there's a lack of services. It's one of the reasons why a lot of people leave these places in the first place, to go and live in cities that have a lot more services like schools, hospitals and the like. You also might need a car if you want to get around because a lot of places probably don't have a good bus system or transport system. There's also limited social interaction because a lot of these places have fairly elderly populations and there's also a lack of leisure options in a lot of these places. And you should also keep in mind that the weather could be a con in a lot of these places because winters can be very cold and summers can be very hot. So keep that in mind. But the good news is that a lot of these places are also offering extra tax incentives to get people to go and live there. And if the village or town has less than 5,000 inhabitants, you can also get a reduction on social security payments. So those were some of the pros and some of the cons of working remotely in one of those villages or towns. On that note, I'll wrap the video up. Questions and comments, please leave them in the section below. Debate the situation out as you normally do. Give the video a thumbs up if you liked it, thumbs down if you didn't. I'll see you in the next one. Hasta luego.